In the previous chapter, we discussed uh, duties, obligations, and responsibilities managers and companies owe their employees. In this chapter, it looks at the flip side of that um, relationship and weighing the ethical dimensions of being uh, considered a worthy employee and responsible co-workers. It's good to remember that uh, we work best when we understand the need to get along and to show uh, loyalty to our employer and each other, uh, as well as our sales values and our own best interests. A duty of loyalty and our best effort are primary uh, obligations as employees, but what they mean can change and have changed over time. Most workers don't have an employment contract, so there may not be a specific agreement between the two parties that detail mutual responsibilities. Uh, instead, there's the common law or case law of agency in each state that is often the source of the rules governing an employment relationship. Uh, the duty of loyalty, which is in all 50 states, requires that an employee refrain from acting in a manner that may be contrary to the employer's interest. And this duty creates some basic rules and provides employers with uh, enforceable rights against employees who might violate them. And in general terms, the duty of loyalty means an employee is obligated to render loyal and faithful service to the employer uh, act in good faith and to com not to compete with, but uh, help to advance employers' interests. Common law of most states holds as a general rule that without asking for and receiving the employer's consent, an employee cannot hold a second job if it would compete or conflict with the first job. Uh, but many employers often grant permission for employees to work in positions that do not compete or interfere with their uh, principal jobs. It is wrong for employees to make work decisions primarily for their own personal gain rather than doing what is in the employer's um, best interest. The degree to which the duty of loyalty exists is usually related to the degree of responsibility or trust an employer places in an employee. More trust equals stronger duty. Uh, for example, when an employee has a very extensive authority or access to confidential information, that duty can rise to the highest level called a fiduciary duty, and we discussed this in um, in chapter four. Uh, according to the pay scale compensation best practices report, the two leading motivators that, that um, provide people reason to leave their jobs uh, are first higher pay and the other is uh, for typically for personal reasons. There are really no generally agreed upon definitions of employees' duty of loyalty. Uh, however, millennials are three times more likely than older generations to change jobs. Uh, 90%, nine out of 10 millennials say they don't expect to stay with their current job longer than three years. And this is compared to older workers who often stay 10 years or even their entire careers with one uh, em employer. And figure 7-2 shows that millennials are more likely to, you know, to job hop. And the Loyalty Research Center is a consulting firm that defined uh, loyal employees as being committed to the success of the organization. And you ask uh, the book we talk about, why do employees feel um, less likely to feel a duty of loyalty. And one reason is that loyalty is a two-way street and it's a feeling that's developed through um, mutual obligations and responsibilities. But most employers don't want to be obligated to their workers in the legal sense. And so this requires that almost all workers are called employees at will without any long-term employment contract. And this sends a message that management is not making a long-term commitment to the employee. 
And this can get let go, you know, the employees can be let go at any time for any legal reason, which is essentially what at will employment means. And at will employment means that employees can, they can also quit at any time. So at will employment usually works though to the employer's advantage and not the employees. Another reason uh, the concept of loyalty to an organization seems to be changing is the important role that money plays. Um, switching jobs, improving salaries, looking to maximize earning potential. Uh, another economic uh, phenomenon uh, that does affect loyalty is, in, especially in the private sector, is a switch from defined benefits to defined contribution retirement plans. Defined benefit plan is a pension, and its employee benefits are usually paid fully by the employer and calculated usually in a formula based on length of employment, salary history, and other factors. Uh, in a defined contribution plan, the employee invests a certain percentage of the salary of the employee in a retirement fund, often a 401k in the, um, it is typically a for-profit employment setting, or a 403b, which is typically non-profit, where it's matched either partially or wholly um, by the employer. Finally, many uh, people work for themselves as a freelance uh, or contract worker, and it's in the gig economy or gig jobs. And they may take assignments from multiple companies at a time, and they're really not an employee in a traditional sense. And so they approach a job um, comparable to maybe like a CPA or attorney where they are professional for a client and they move on to the next client and they keep uh, pretty much an independent status. So you wouldn't expect gig workers to demonstrate um, employer loyalty when they're really not uh, employees. The, um, the reality is that salary places an important role in an employee's decision to move to a new job. Uh, sometimes companies give retention bonuses, and that is a, a wonderful technique to instill loyalty. There was a glass door study that showed when changing jobs, an increase of more than 5% in salary uh, alone, not including benefits, was the motive. And the same study found a 10% increase pay up the odds of an employee would stay at the company. Um, and the importance is maintaining competitive pay is an important part of reducing turnover. Uh, the Society for Human Resource Management believes that retention plans should be a part of an overall strategy and really not merely just giving uh, away tenure. And in the competitive world of business, um, many employees encounter uh, a lot of information in their in their work day, and ex the employer expects that they will keep this confidential. And this information usually is proprietary, private information. It may be patent and copyright information, employee records and history, customer related data. And employers are within their rights to expect employees to honor their duty of confidentiality and maintain. Uh, the secrecy of proprietary information or materials. Sometimes the duty of confidentiality originates uh, in an employment contract, and if not, the duty still exists in most situations under common law agency. Uh, an employment agreement will typically list a variety of requirements. There's also work for hire, and that's a contract that usually contains a specific clause uh, stating that the company owns any work and assigning ownership of them to the company. And it also contains a patent um, assignment provision. Um, employers also want to protect what we call trade secrets. And in figure 7.3 uh, shows copyright, trademarks, patents. Registered trademarks and content covered by patents are protected by law, but trade secrets have no official status and they don't enjoy the same level of federal protection. 
Trade secrets are information that is economic value because it's generally not known to the public and is kept secret. Um, technical or design information, advertising, marketing plans, research development. Uh, Non-disclosure agreements are used to protect against the theft of all such information, and most of it is which is protected normally by the company's requirement of secrecy, uh, not by federal intellectual property law. So federal law protects registered trademarks, and these are words, designs, logos, slogans, symbols, and trade dress, which is uh, appearance or packaging, and grants creators copyright, um, protect original uh, artistic or written expression, books, painting, music, work records, plays, movies, and patents, uh, which includes um, inventions. Uh, U.S. companies have all long used uh, non-compete agreements as a way to provide another layer of confidentiality, and it ensures that employers with access to sensitive information will not compete with the company during or for some time period of time after their employment. The purpose of these agreements is to protect the company's intellectual property. Uh, which is the manifestation of their original ideas protected by legal means such as a patent or copyright or trademark, and it's usually limited by time and distance. Some companies have begun uh, requiring mid and lower level of workers to, um, to do this and attempt to prevent them from changing jobs. Uh, California passed a law in 2017 uh, where most non-compete agreements are void, holding that although an employee may owe the employer responsibility not to compete while employed, uh, the duty ceases upon uh, termination of employment. So the employee does not belong to the company forever. Uh, an example, case example of a non-compete given in the book was Jimmy John's, and they had enforced a non-compete agreement for low-wage workers that prohibited them from working at other sandwich shops and agreed to stop using the agreements in the future. This was like in 2016. And the ruling was that it limited the mobility and opportunity of the most vulnerable workers and, and basically bullied them into staying with threat of being sued. And also saying that by locking them the low-wage workers into their jobs, it prohibited them from seeking better paying jobs elsewhere, and the companies had had no reason, Jimmy John had no reason for, to increase their wages or benefits, which was not fair. Employees also uh, will use non-solicitation clauses, and these protect a business from an employee who leads for another job and then attempts to lure customers or other former colleagues into following them. A non-compete uh, clause, the employee agrees that for a period of time of one year after the employee no longer works for the company, the employee will not engage in the same or similar activities as were performed for the company, and generally this is within a 100-mile radius of the company. A final clause um, that might be required is a non-disparagement clause, and it prohibits defaming or deliberately running down the reputation of a former uh, employee. Next, we'll look at loyalty to the brand and customers. A good employment relationship is obviously beneficial to both management and employees, and every employee should be willing to make a sincere commitment to an ethical employer. <clears throat> Every company puts a lot of time and effort money into developing a brand, and examples are Apple, Coca-Cola, Amazon, B&W, McDonald's, and they have coveted brands and they've done branding, creating, differentiating, maintaining a brand image or reputation. And these are important ways to build company value, to sell products and services, and expand corporate goodwill. And the term brand encompasses image, reputation, logo, tagline, even color scheme. Um, it can be challenging to protect a brand nowadays, especially with social media, 
employees can post negative information about the brands on the internet. Examples in the book given were Taco Bell on Facebook, where an employee was shown licking a row of tacos. Uh, Domino's Pizza em em employee showed um, can be seen on YouTube, spitting on food, on Twitter. A Burger King employee in Japan posted a photo of himself lying on hamburger buns while on duty. All three of these companies experienced a financial and goodwill loss after these kind of incidents and struggled to restore public confidence afterwards in their products. According to a Harvard Business Review interview uh, with the Glo global vice president of McDonald's, um, good branding requires that the business think of marketing not just to its customers, but also to the employees and who he deems is the very people who can make the brand come alive. And the process of getting employees to believe in the product, to commit to the idea that the company is selling something worth buying or even think about buying is called internal marketing. And internal marketing helps employees make a personal connection to the products and services the business sells. Employees are more likely to develop some degree of brand loyalty when they share a common sense of purpose and identity with, um, with the company. Next, let's look at contributing to a positive work atmosphere. There's not a slide on this, but I wanted to talk about it. Um, you spend a lot of time with your co-workers, more so sometimes than anyone else, which includes your family and friends. And so the ability to go along with with colleagues at work has a very significant impact on your life and your attitude towards your job and the employer. And so employees owe one another courtesy and respect, uh, limiting arguments to principles and not personalities. So important things to, about getting along with coworkers, um, keep, one important thing is to keep an open mind. Don't make prejudgments. Um, remember to be kind. Uh, performing random acts of kindness can help someone have a better day. Uh, respect each other and show it. Uh, avoid doing things that might offend others. Uh, and don't be narrow-minded. Be willing to listen and tolerate differing points of view. Definitely avoid sexual jokes and stories and anecdotes and innuendos. Uh, just make an effort to get along with everyone, even the difficult people. You don't always choose your coworkers. Some may be hard to get along with, but professionalism requires that we do attempt to have a good working relationship, no matter the opinions we might have about the coworkers. Uh, but it's our responsibility in the workplace to respect and act civilly toward each other. The other thing is don't gossip, especially on social media. Uh, it's petty, it's small, and it's untrustworthy. Understanding personalities um, can be complex, um, and it's helpful to develop your own emotional intelligence, which is the capacity to recognize other people's emotions and allow uh, also to know and manage your own. Uh, using emotional intelligence is showing empathy. It's a willingness to step uh, into someone else's shoes. All of us have different workplace personalities which express the way we think and act on the job. Uh, there are many personalities. There's none that's one that's superior over the other. Uh, some of us lead with our brains and emphasize logic and reason. Others with our hearts, always emphasizing mercy over justice and relationship with others. And employees can have different work styles in which they feel com uh, comfortable accomplishing tasks. Some of us gravitate to being independent, getting jobs and tasks accomplished alone. Others prefer teams and project work. There's no right or wrong style, but it benefits any worker to know his or her preferences and something about the personalities also of our colleagues. Uh, again, there's not a slide on this, but I wanted to talk about a few other things. Reducing workplace violence. It is a reality, and employees play a role in helping make workers safe um, and harmonious place. We have employees have a legal and ethical duty not, um, and we have an ethical duty not to be violent at work. Managers have a duty to prevent or stop violence. So there are different types of um, violence, traditional criminal intent, um, 
and the perpetrator has no relationship to the business or employees. Uh, the worker work related deaths account for worker on worker deaths account for about 15% of those homicides and contributing factors include failure to conduct a criminal background check as part of the hiring process. Uh, when the violence arises from problems in personal relationships, typically the perpetrator often has a direct relationship with the victim and not the business. And the victim is the employee, is an employee. And less than 10% of workplace homicides account for these type of, of violent acts. Women are typically at higher risk of being involved in, as victims of this type of violence than men. A large por uh, portion of customer incidents occur in nightclubs, restaurants, healthcare industries, and that's about a fifth of all workplace homicides uh, result in these type of violence as the personal. Uh, most businesses provide a written code of conduct or ethics. Um, typically, the code of conduct um, had, contains a variety of standard clauses, blending legal uh, compliance and ethical considerations. So the book gives a sample code of conduct um, compliance with law, all laws, corruption and fraud, addresses conflict of interest, uh, company property, cybersecurity, digital device policy, social media policy, sexual harassment, um, and workplace uh, respect. And two areas that are um, really worth mentioning are cybersecurity and harassment. There have been a lot of large companies like Equifax, LinkedIn, Sony, Facebook, Chase, Morgan have suffered the theft of customer information um, leading to loss of consumer confidence. And these are, are large fines can be levied against these type of companies. Increased level of public awareness about harassment in the workplace. Uh, has been seen recently, especially with uh, the Me Too movement when in 2017-18 um, a lot of sexual predation uh, done by powerful men in, in Hollywood and Washington, D.C. have come to light. Next, we'll look at um, financial integrity. Employees face uh, ethical dilemmas in, in areas of finance, especially in situations such as bribery and insider trading and securities. Uh, insider, insider trading and bribery are serious violations of the law that can result in uh, incarceration and large fines. The buying or selling of stocks, bonds, other investments based on non-public information that is likely to affect the, uh, the price of security being traded is called insider information. And although insider trading can be difficult to prove, it's essentially is cheating. It's illegal, it's unethical, it's unfair, it, it injures other investors and undermines public confidence. Insider trading laws are pretty complex. They develop through Federal court interpretations of the Security and Exchange Act of 1934 and actions by the U.S. Security Exchange uh, Commission, SEC. And the law identifies several kinds of violations. The concept of an insider is broad. It could be an officer, director, employee of a company. There are also temporary insiders, and these can be investment bankers, brokers, accountants, and um, attorneys. There's a famous case um, that is the um, known as security, the SEC versus Texas Gulf Sulphur Company. This dates back to 1968 uh, with the discovery of the Kid Mine and Im implicated employees of uh, Texas Mining Company. And when first notified of the discovery of a very large and valuable copper deposit, um, mine employees bought stock in the company while keeping the information secret. So when the information was released to the public, the price of the stock went up and the employees sold their stock and they made a lot of money. The SEC, along with the Department of Justice, Justice um, prosecuted employees for insider trading and won that conviction. Um, and they, the employees had to um, give back the money that they uh, had, had made on, on the trade. Next, um, we are 
looking at um, the, I got a little lost on my slide here. I apologize. Um, the whistle blowing, um, we'll talk a little bit about whistle blowing next. Um, there was, there is a lot I want to go over though that I, I didn't necessarily do slides for. Uh, going back to to bribery, um, it's a payment in some material form. It can be cash, it can be non-cash for an act that runs counter legal and ethical culture. Um, it Bribery is a violation in all 50 states, and it's a federal law that prohibits bribery in international transactions, and that is the Foreign Corruptions um, Corrupt Practices Act. And a lot of it we uh, can revolve around gift giving and receiving, and a lot of it hinges on the value of the gift, the, the purpose, the circumstances in which it was given, the position of the person receiving it, com company policy or law. Uh, the company wants a, the if a company though wants the employee to do the right thing, there has to be policies and provisions that ensure the employees know what the rules and consequences uh, are. Typically, an employee generally can accept a gift of less than twenty dollars. Uh, entertainment gifts like restaurant meals are restricted, and gifts have to be reported uh, when their total value from one source exceeds three hundred ninety dollars in a calendar year. Uh, another area of bribery uh, that's challenging is in international business arenas, and the U.S. law prohibits bribery in international business dealings, um, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is an amendment to the Security and Exchange Act of 1934, and it's one of the most important laws promoting transparency in government uh, and go corporate governance. The main purpose is to make it illegal for companies and their managers to influence or bribe foreign officials with um, money or rewards of any kind uh, to get or keep business opportunities outside of the United States. And it's enforced through the joint effort of SEC and Department of Justice. Foreign corporations whose stock is traded in the U.S. Uh, acting in further furtherance of a corporate, uh, foreign corporate practice um, whether they're physically present in the U.S. is called nationality principle. Anti-bribery law is a serious issue um, for companies with overseas business and cross-border sales. Uh, that can result in significant fines and prison time. So the Foreign, Cor Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, it prohibits an agent of any company incorporated in the, in the United States from extending uh, a bribe to a government a foreign government official to achieve a business advantage in that country, but it does not specifically prohibit the extension of a bribe to a private officer of a non-governmental non company in a foreign country. An exception is made for what we call facilitating or grease payments. Those are small amounts of money paid to low-level government workers, and that's done in an effort to maybe speed routine tasks like processing paperwork, uh, but it doesn't influ influence the granting of a contract. And the FCPA disadvantages U.S. firms, some people believe. Um, others say it's the backbone of an ethical free enterprise. Some nations consider business bribery, bribery to be culturally acceptable, and so they turn a blind eye. Uh, but the fact is that since the U.S. passed the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, other nations have followed suit, mostly in the United Kingdom and European nations, uh, European Union nations. Um, the uh, employees may find themselves being asked to do something that's legal, but it may be considered not considered ethical. Um, so those are things to to consider. Um, a little bit about pay secrecy. Um, it's a policy that prohibits employees from disclosing uh, salaries among themselves, but 10 states have enacted laws banning that, um, and most pay secrecy policies are unenforceable um, 
and, and uh, violate federal, federal labor law. And in 2014, uh, the president, President Obama, issued an executive order banning companies that engaged in federal contracting from prohibiting um, salary discussions there. So now, here we go, to um, finally to whistleblowing. Oh, the act of whistleblowing, uh, which is going to a government agency and disclosing an employer's violation of the law, is different from everyday criticism. Uh, it's viewed as a public service, really, to reduce bad behavior in the workplace. It's not easy um, to be a whistleblower. There are many hurdles. It can ruin a career. It can, uh, people have uh, not been promoted or face resentment from coworkers. They can be blacklisted uh, and all resulting from doing what is ethical. But uh, ethicists say it should be done with an appropriate motive to get the company to comply with the law or protect potential victims, not to get revenge on a boss or because you're angry. So knowing when and how to blow the whistle is a challenge. Uh, for employees who really just want to do the right thing. And it's encouraged to first do try internal reporting, uh, and that will give management a chance to start an investigation and attempt to rectify the situation. Uh, there has to be some kind of hard evidence. The violation should be serious. Blowing the whistle should have some likelihood that the um, of stopping the, the wrongful act. A lot of whistleblowing is done in the environmental arena. People who are concerned with clean air and water and uh, are protected by the Water Pollution Control Act. More, um, the, there is a provision called the Key TAM provision of the law, and it allows private persons, and we call these uh, relators. And, and not necessarily whistleblowers, um, to file lawsuits uh, for violations uh, of the FCA on behalf of the government and to re but receive part of any penalty imposed. So the person bringing the action is a type of whistleblower um, and it's one who initiates legal action on his or her own rather than simply reporting it to a government agency. If the government believes that it is worthwhile case and intervenes with a lawsuit, then the relator uh, is entitled to receive between 15 and 25% of the amount the government recovers. If the government thinks winning is a long shot and declines to intervene in the lawsuit, um, a relator share can increase to 25 to 30%. There are several cases that are shown in the book, uh, people that have um, higher, high profile cases or whistleblower or relators, and they turned in companies that were cheating the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, which affected taxpayers, or the IRS, which affected government revenues, and private health insurance affecting pre, um, premiums. Uh, Enron is another case that's shown in the book. It's one of the most infamous examples of corporate fraud in U.S. history, and it destroyed the company and it resulted in about $60 billion in lost shareholder value. And the officer of the company, Sharon Watkins, discovered the fraud. She went to her boss who did nothing. She went several times and um, she was uh, reporting suspected accounting and financial irregularities. She was ignored uh, by the boss and eventually went to the press, but because she didn't go directly to the SEC, she received no whistleblower protection. And the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was not passed until after uh, the Enron scandal. I hope you've enjoyed this chapter and please use the study guide. Um, the PowerPoint and lecture uh, is for your benefit and um, the study guide really covers what will be uh, given on the exam.